All right. Morning, everybody. Come on in. And uh, we're going to worship God. Have a good Sunday together. God is good. i 
sun will rise You'll come to us Certain as the dawn appears You will go Let your glory fall as you respond To us Spirit praying Flood into our thirsty heart again You'll come, you'll come We are not shaken, we are not moved We wait upon you, Lord
nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Thank you, Lord. What can we say, Lord? That your name is higher. Higher than anything, Lord. We thank you that we can call on your name. We can be called by your name. We worship you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this day, Lord, to acknowledge your greatness. We thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn around and say hi to somebody. Hello, welcome. Good to see the Harms family back with us, feeling better and stronger. So good to see his mischief lots. And the rest of you, you're looking good. Sorry, Cheryl, I'll stay over here. <laughs> uh, just a few quick announcements again uh, this morning. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, Overshot our goal of $750 for the uh, uh, Pregnancy Support Center, the Atwell in, uh, in Hamilton and Halton. So let's give, uh, give God a, uh, uh, honor him for, and, and all of you that have been uh, a part of that, it's, uh, it's great. We're only partway through. We have till, uh, till Father's Day that we're participating with, the, uh, uh, with the, that group there in, uh, with Atwell. Uh, and so it's good to just set a goal and then to, uh, with God's help, uh, Bridge and breach that goal, uh, so we can still actually give towards that. Just because we've reached our goal doesn't mean that there aren't needs beyond that. Uh, so if you still want to participate with that, there are, I believe maybe I haven't put them out on the on the table today. Forgot that, but uh, I'll make sure that they get out on the uh, on the desk there uh, that you can see that information to participate with that. Uh, there is a junior youth uh, this morning for. Uh, uh, so we're glad uh, that Ben is back for uh, and feeling better. So praise God for that. So if you have uh, junior youth age and all, of course, of our children and, uh, and nursery are uh, available this morning. Uh, the only other announcement that I have, you know, sometimes we, we, things happen every single week. All of our volunteers are just giving so much all the time, whether it's children's workers or those that are help with set up and tear down. Uh, our sound people, those that take care of all the things that go on behind the scenes, we just want to say thank you. We really do. I know that, that you don't do it to be recognized or honored or any of those things, and, and we get that. Um, but uh, everything that you do means a lot. It means a lot to those that may be visiting for the first time or uh, those that come every single week. There are chairs that are set up. There are things that, that, that are... Uh, that are happening, and, uh, and we just thank you for everything you do. Men's meeting is, uh, is on for this coming Saturday morning at uh, my place, 9 o'clock. If you need the address, let me know. I'll text it to you. Um, and uh, it just runs from 9, to 9 o'clock till 10.30. We try to keep it pretty tight. If you want to stay longer, it's always good for that too. But uh, those that have a busy Saturday mornings uh, for you guys, just let me know if, uh, if you don't have the information, and I'll get it to you. And uh, uh, other than that, uh, children are released for, uh, to children's ministry. And uh, I'm going to invite Jim up to, with the message this morning. Good morning. Hey, what a great day. What a great time of worship together. We're coming at the book of uh, Ecclesiastes again uh, this morning, that uplifting inspiring, happy, smiley book in the Old Testament. Uh, although, you know, it may be appropriate for some of the times we're in and some of the things we struggle with. If you watch the news and tune into current events, sometimes it's easy to feel discouraged and to feel like, like, like things are especially challenging, and, and perhaps they are. Uh, many are, have become like the drunk who was lying passed out on the barroom floor and he began to stir, and as he began to come around, a practical joker came up to him and 
uh, smeared a little Limburger cheese on his upper lip. And as the man came around, he finally got up and he walked outside the tavern. He came back in a few minutes later looking puzzled and concerned. Uh, he walked back outside the tavern again. He, he, he was out there for a couple of minutes. Uh, he came back inside again and he shook his head disgustedly and he said, it's no use. The whole world stinks. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of people who look at the world today and maybe even look at their own lives and say, you know, it's no use. The whole thing's a mess. The whole world stinks. And we're going to raise some questions today, and we're going to re-engage some of these things again not next Sunday, but questions that deal with the issues of unfairness. Unfairness. If God is good and in control, why is life unfair? Now, this is the great problem, the problem of pain, the problem of suffering, the, the problem of injustice. Philosophers, academics, theologians have wrestled with this. Even committed followers of Jesus Christ and believers in God have wrestled with this. It's, it's not something that is immediately going to be resolved in every way through a single Sunday or even a series of Sundays. But if God is good, and he's in control. Why is life unfair? Why is my life unfair? That's really what we're asking a lot of the time. If God loves me, have you ever had anybody in your Christian experience say to you, God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life, right? Well, you know, if God loves me and has a wonderful plan for my life, I, he forgot to tell the doctor that, you know, at the last appointment when the doctor said, I'm sorry, we've done all we can. You know, uh, there's nothing more we can do. Hmm. If God has a wonderful plan for my life, he obviously forgot to mention that uh, to, to my spouse before he or she walked out of my world and it fell apart and I was left devastated and reeling and trying to repair everything. Uh, if God has a wonderful plan for my life, I wish he had told it to my employer before I got fired. I'm doing my best to live right how come so many things go wrong? And we're going to just begin to look at those issues today. I believe we'll, we'll barely scratch the surface. You've got to come back uh, the next Sunday. We'll go a little deeper. We're going to actually find ourselves in the book of Job. Heaven help me. Uh, but, you know, I wonder why things happen the way they do. And I find myself sometimes saying, God, why? Anybody else? Yeah, don't leave me dying up here. I mean, you know, we all do it. Probably when you were a kid, I'm going to presume when you were a kid or, or maybe a preschooler, you were taught to share your toys. You were taught to, to share your games. Uh, you saw mom carefully cut the pie into equal portions so that everybody would get an equal amount. You were taught the value of fairness, and you were taught that if you were good and fair, others would be good and fair back to you. What an idea. What a world that would be. But you didn't have to get a whole lot older, did you? And now, especially as an adult, probably you realize that and wrestle with the issue of fairness. You've probably observed by now that, that life isn't always fair, and you're learning that, but you're not sure you understand it. I came across this article, Great Truths About Life That Adults Have Learned. You don't really learn these things until you've been around a little while. Uh, here's one. Uh, for example, uh, things to be thankful for if you take time to look for it. For example, I'm standing here right now thinking how nice it is that wrinkles don't hurt. <laughs> a reason to smile. Every seven minutes of every day, someone in an aerobics class pulls a muscle. Middle age is when you choose cereal for the fiber, not for the toy. The more you complain, the longer God lets you live. If you remain calm in an emergency, you just don't have all the facts. The other line always moves faster until you get in it. If you can smile when things go wrong, it probably means you have someone to blame. You know you're getting older when you stoop to tie your shoes and wonder what else you can do while you're down there, right? But the greatest truth is this, folks. Life at least by the way we measure the things we use to judge it, it's just not fair. And the Bible is very clear as it shows us, without many, making any attempt to hide it, just how unfair life can be. The Bible wants us to know that, that this isn't it, folks. 
Uh, this isn't heaven. Uh, heaven will not be ours on this earth. Heaven is perfect. Earth is imperfect. And, and while God is busy shaping us as, as, as we submit to him and conforming us into his likeness, more and more the likeness of his son, uh, there will still be imperfection on earth, and there is much in the world system that's not fair. So the book of Ecclesiastes was written by whom? Well, we actually don't know. It's, if, if you look at it, it's, it's interesting. There's a narrator at the beginning and the end who then introduces a teacher. Uh, there's some good reasons to believe it, it was Solomon. It was a very wise and powerful person, but he's never named as the author. But he takes this journey through life, and he looks at everything and comes to the occlusion that, that all is vanity and life is just unfair. And I want us to look at five snapshots from the book of Ecclesiastes that demonstrate just what the nature of this world and this life really is. So uh, look at exhibit A, observation no, number one from a wise man. Solomon says, I've noticed that criminals go unpunished. I've noticed that criminals go unpunished. Ecclesiastes 3.16 says, I notice that throughout the earth, justice is giving way to crime, and even the courts are corrupt. Nothing has changed in 3,000 years. Solomon says, some people never receive justice. Solomon says, people get off, and the criminals don't get what they deserve. Ecclesiastes 8.11 says, when the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, people feel it is safe to do wrong. Now, I don't know how this could be any more relevant than today because criminals know they, they really have nothing to fear uh, in our society anymore. And you see some of the things that, that happen in, in stores and, and shoplifting and uh, the refusal of law enforcement to, to do anything about it in, in many cases or, or just other kinds of crimes go unpunished, criminals go unpunished. It's a pretty safe bet to say that if you commit a crime in the first place, it's very unlikely that you will go to jail for it, especially if you're somebody with wealth and status, because given enough time, given enough appeals, given enough money, all you have to do is have the right attorney. They'll find some technicality to get you off the hook, some loophole that allows you to plead guilty to a lesser charge. Not only that, it could be years before your trial even goes to court. Not only that, you can then sell your story uh, you know, for a book deal, or market yourself in some way, profiting off a heinous crime. You may not remember the name, you're not some of you as old as me, but a Canadian serial killer, it was quite a controversy, named Clifford Olson, was paid $10,000 per corpse if he would name where the bodies could be found so that the families could grieve. $10,000 per, per, per corpse. Justice is perverted. Crimes go unpunished. And young offenders say, hey, why should, why should I follow the rules? What are they going to do to me anyway? Solomon said, I see all this happening. Criminals don't get the punishment they should while victims and victim families continue to suffer. And he says, that's not fair. And you know what? He's absolutely right. Number two, fourth chapter, Solomon says, I've noticed that the oppressed go unhelped. The oppressed go unhelped. Ecclesiastes 4.11. Then I looked at the injustice that goes on in this world. The oppressed were crying, and no one would help them. If you know anything about human history, you know that history is a record of the fact that human nature tries to dominate one another. We see this unfolding in places like the Ukraine. The wars we see in our world today are mostly wars of oppression. In Yemen and Sierra Leone, Hundreds of thousands are dying in civil wars where one people group is trying to dominate another. It's not making headlines here, but it's tragic. And the oppressed don't get justice. Did you know that all over the world today, the state of religious persecution, that, that, that Christians are experiencing oppression, persecution, and martyrdom on a scale unmatched and unrivaled in all of history. More Christians have been persecuted or martyred in the past few decades than in the previous 2,000 years. Where is the justice in that? Solomon says there is oppression everywhere, and nobody is helping these people. And he says it's not fair. 
And again, I have to confer, con- concur. He's right. He's right. Number three, Solomon says, I've noticed that politicians are unethical. Oh, really? Politicians, are... now, uh, do I even need to give you an illustration uh, for this point? You know, we, we see it. Influence peddling, ballot stuffing, illegal fundraising, cover-ups, hypocrisy, scandals, dishonesty, immorality in the highest offices in the land, calling good evil and evil good is nothing new. One of the things I love about the Bible is that it doesn't pull its punches. It just tells the truth. And it doesn't matter if it offends me or not. It just tells it like it is. And the truth written 3,000 years ago in Ecclesiastes 5, 8, it says this, For every official is under orders from higher up, so the matter is lost in red tape and bureaucracy. That's pretty current, isn't it? And here's a blunt verse, Ecclesiastes 10, 6. Here is all injustice. Stupid people are given positions of authority. I want to read that to you again because it's fun to say. Stupid people are given positions of authority. Have you ever ever felt that way when you look around? And he says it isn't fair. And you know what? He's right. Number four, I've noticed that good people go unrewarded. Good people go unrewarded. It says sometimes, Ecclesiastes 8.14, sometimes righteous people suffer for what the wicked do, and wicked people get what the righteous deserve. This is all very vexing and troublesome. There's a word we need to bring back, vexing. This is all very vexing and and troublesome. I think I'm just becoming a a grumpy old man because I feel vexed uh, frequently. But, uh, you know, he's talking about why is it that good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people. Just doesn't seem right, does it? Doesn't it bother you that some unscrupulous people win while righteous people struggle? Doesn't it seem upsetting that some unscrupulous corporations succeed while corporations that try to maintain good standards, ethical conduct, go bankrupt? Does it ever bother you that the unethical salesperson often gets the uh, the, the, the deal signed and gets the job done? When the honest salesman who has ethics doesn't get the deal, doesn't it bother you that sometimes dishonest people get promoted while honest people get overlooked? Does it ever bother you that people like drug lords and mafia bosses and porno kings and useless uh, social media influencers live in luxury while honest people sometimes can hardly make a living? Solomon says, that's not fair. And he's four for five, man. He's right again. Number five. He says, I've noticed that capable people aren't always successful. And the good guys don't always win. You know, sometimes nice guys do finish last. At least by the way the world measures success. Ecclesiastes 9.11 says this. I realized another thing. That in this world, fast runners do not always win the races, and the brave don't always win the battles. Wise men don't always earn a living. Intelligent men don't always get rich, and capable men don't always rise to high positions. So notice what Solomon says in this one verse. He said that the fastest runners, or the athlete that prepares the most, doesn't always win the race. Isn't it ironic that there are those who will train for two or three or four years or all their life for an Olympic event, and on the very day that they're to compete, they come down with the flu or they pull a hamstring. In the 2000 Olympics, a whole team missed a race simply because the Olympic bus, the transportation provided, got to the event two minutes late. Is that fair? After all they put into it, all the training, the travel, the sacrifice, and they miss it through some fluke thing, or the, the steroid-taking athlete, or the one who's most able to, uh, to, to avoid screening for illegal uh, enhancement drugs, wins, and the honest one loses. Then he says, wise men don't always earn a living. That's pretty obvious. We all know bright, educated, hard-working people who hardly get by, and Yet we know about these do-nothing playboy bums who inherit millions, and they're not even grateful for it. Solomon says that's not fair, and he's right. In our society, the biggest salaries don't always go to the smartest people or the hardest workers or the most ethical. 
In our culture, we pay athletes hundreds of millions of dollars. We pay guys who dribble balls and put them through little hoops a thousand times more than we pay the teachers who train our kids or the social workers who help the poor on our streets. Medical missionaries, gifted doctors on the mission field have to beg for money to buy antibiotics and supplies while multi-million dollar contracts are offered to NFL players to, to play 16 games on a Sunday afternoon in a six month period. What's wrong with this picture? Solomon says that's just not fair and he's right. And so it's natural to question why. Nothing strange, nothing, nothing weird or weak in your faith to think, man, this gets a little bewildering at times. A little boy asked his dad one day as they drove in the car, he said, Daddy, why are leaves green? He said, well, son, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. He said, well, Daddy, how was the moon able to stay suspended in space? And his dad said, well, I really don't know the exact answer to that question either. He said, well, Daddy, how is it the bats can fly and find their way around when they're not even able to see? And his dad said, well, I'm not sure on that one either. And his son said, Daddy, do you mind if I ask these questions? His dad said, of course not, son. How else are you going to learn? <laughs> <You know? laughs> we want answers, right? We, we, we wonder why. So as we look at the issue of why, as we discuss some answers to this problem, let me say this. Sometimes there is no ready answer. You know, you can't just reach in a pocketbook and say, but here it is, this, this explains it all, you know? So suffer happily. Uh, sometimes God does not supply a reason. Sometimes God says, my ways are higher than your ways, and sometimes you're just gonna have to trust me and have faith in my ability to run the universe. His ways are higher, his thoughts are higher, and, and that's what makes him God. He wouldn't be much of a God if I understood or could anticipate his every move. And he sure wouldn't be much of a God if he behaved and did and executed my version of what fairness or what life would look like. He wouldn't be much of a God if I could figure out his every move. But if I will have faith, the Bible says that God will be pleased with me. But this issue of the silence of God is a difficult one. And we're going to tackle it in the next message because throughout the book of Job, Job's like wagging his finger. He's suffering. He's confused. And God is silent. His friends are offering lots of advice. The world speaks, but God is silent. And why do I experience so much unfairness? And why, if I'm trying to be good, do bad things happen? Well, today I'm going to just give some really simple answers. They, they might sound cliche, but... The, it's because they're true. They're true. I'm not trying to trivialize anything, though. So uh, let's look at some, some, some difficult answers and, and some problems. Here's the problem. The world has been corrupted by sin. And hear me carefully here. The problem is a lot worse than we think. It's way worse than we think. You know, we tend to, 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 to just so poo-poo our sins like it's, it's no big deal when I do it, you know, we don't even, uh, I think it was W.C. Fields who used to talk about his little peccadillos, you know, peccadillos is just in case it's not used much anymore, it's just a fancy word for sin, indiscretions, oh, you know, I slipped, I slipped, man, the corruption that has entered the world, it's dark, it's sinister, it's evil, it's at war with good, and it's worse than you think. And we have to own that before we understand anything that we're going to talk about and before we can even begin to grasp what it is that God has delivered us from and is inviting us into for all of eternity. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, when they were so deceived to think that they could be like God, that they could be gods, a corruption was loosed upon the world that has been and is devastating. And it's a lot worse than we think. And every time we choose, you know, our little peccadillos, every time we choose to disobey God, we open a portal for more sins of corrupting power to contaminate the minds of men, to hurt and harm others, and produce a harvest of hell. I'm reading a book. Uh, for those of you who like fantasy, you might enjoy this book. 
That author's last name is going blank on me. I'm not through it yet, so this is a reserved recommendation. But it's done in the, 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 the form of, it's fantasy. It's like a Narnia or, or Lord of the Rings or something like that. There's deep allegory in it, powerful allegory in it, although I'm not sure that the author is a Christian and is intending that it relate directly to, say, Christ as Aslan, as we would see in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and such thing. But in this book, Uprooted, there's a corruption in the world that is spreading. You know that this story is told again and again and again and again and again and again and again in various forms, in all cultures, over all time, in every place in the world, in some form. And creatures touched by the corruption go mad. They become true beasts and they will spread the madness. They spread the corruption, a madness that leads to a horrible death unless they are destroyed by fire. Sometimes the corruption grips men and women, and soon madness and terrifying, convulsing death consumes entire villages in this book. The corruption continues unabated until the infected are either destroyed or until it is held back, contained, limited, or restrained by a great force, a deep, deep magic. Sometimes a healer, a wizard, a priest, right, is able to summon some powers, prepare some elixir, some incantation to cleanse and restore an infected person if the corruption has not yet completely overtaken him. Is it true that the story lines runs through a lot of tales in our world? Okay. Uh, but sometimes the corruption's still there. You ever seen a movie like where where uh, some kind of horror movie where, where the priest, you know, cleanses the house or, you know, delivers the person of the demon possession. But then a few scenes later, you just see a little clue that something's still lurking, maybe a little glimmer in the eye, and that the corruption has only been a, a delayed, delayed. Well, in the book, Uprooted, most towns and villages have a protector so that when the corruption comes, corruption pushes out of the dark and tangled woods, where it dwells. And sometimes the, the protector is usually able to freeze the onslaught in its tracks. But it's always there, lurking, waiting, ready to strike. Sin, sorrows, and thorns, far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as, far as the curse is found. Okay. The village in the book I'm reading is protected by someone or something called the dragon. He's a man, but this is how he is known and what he is called, the dragon. The villagers fear the dragon, but they need him. And so they're willing to pay him tribute and make terrible sacrifices because uh, those sacrifices, those tributes, they're not as horrifying as the corruption that threatens and awaits all the time. So looking for a crack, always looking for a crack that it might slip through to consume the entire land. And so the villagers have seen the corruption. They've seen what it does to people, and they don't want it. And so the villagers are, they pay tribute. They make sacrifices. The villagers are visited in this story every 10 years by the dragon. They pay him tribute, and they make a terrible sacrifice. One of the villagers' daughters will go away with the dragon every 10 years. It's not immediately clear as you read the book what happens to them, but it's not as grim, dark, or vile as, as you might think. I'm beginning to put that together. But the dragon holds the corruption at bay. Now, we know this corruption. We do. We feel it. We sense it. Stories like Uprooted have been told for thousands of years, thousands of years. There's this terrifying corruption, a monster, something. Great magic is required to hold it back, to push it back. Sacrifices are made to appease the gods, and for a time, the corruption is cleansed and restrained. For a time. You know, C.S. Lewis does a fantastic job of portraying the corruption, a place where people are, are frozen, stone-like, 
in place, a, a world where it's always winter, but never Christmas. And these allegories, these stories and tales, they're told in every culture throughout history for thousands of years, even ours. And you know why they're told? Some form of them? Because it's true. It's true. And it's deep. And the corruption is real. And it's a formidable enemy. And we know this, and we know this deep down, right down to our very bones. If something is in every culture, if something is common to every human experience, that there's a corruption that, 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 that mankind sees around him, or a corruption that he recognizes in himself, the experience of guilt is universal. When, when men recognize their own capacity for evil or the evil that's in the world, and then there has to be always some form of repentance, some form of magic, some kind of sacrifice, some atonement to take place to, if not be thoroughly cleansed, at least to appease, restrain, push back, withhold. So religions have their shamans and witch doctors and priests, and sacrifices are made to cleanse and be free of the corruption that always inevitably brings death, horrible death. The world has been corrupted by sin, and the problem is much worse than we think. It's not a little thing. Just say, well, I'm just going to shave it a little bit here, or I'm just going to cheat in this area, or, you know, I'm going to break faith with someone who trusts me. I'm going to be disloyal to a friend. I'm just going to tell this little lie, and then we say, you know what, because after all, like I didn't, it's not like I murdered anyone. You've come closer to that than you realize. You've come closer to it than you know. And we live in a world where relationships are wrecked between husbands and wives, employers and employees, sons, daughters, and parents, nations, because of, you know, just little things that unleash hell on earth. It's not a little thing. Here's the second aspect of this, and this is number two. God is going to have the last word. God is going to have the last word. God is going to settle accounts one day. So back to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 3.17 says, In due season, God will judge everything man does, both good and bad. What this is saying is that the current state of unfairness in the world is not the end of the story because the final chapter has still not been written and a deliverer has come. The books have not been closed. God has not fully balanced the books yet. And I believe this and folks, if I didn't, I would be in total despair this morning because you, you see the news, you see how sick it's getting and we seem powerless to change it or improve it, or correct it. Uh, the problem's evident when I, when I look in the mirror, even. And it would be a travesty, you know, when, when, when we see the things, that the, the injustices, it would be a travesty if uh, somebody like Adolf Hitler, who always comes up because he's a much greater sinner than the rest of us, obviously. But, you know, he who had over six million Jews killed in the ovens of Nazi Germany, it would be a travesty for him to get away without punishment. That's unthinkable. And so God says, I'm going to be a God of justice. Now, sometimes that doesn't comfort us very much. In the midst of our trouble, we say, well, okay, God, how about now? This would be a real good time for some of that justice, right? Why not intervene? Why not now? Why are you letting my life become more and more confused? Why don't you just set the record straight today? Close the books and bring forth justice. Well, folks, you can be glad that God hasn't come yet in his ultimate expression of judgment, because it shows his mercy that much more, and it reveals how desperately we need him as our Savior. It shows what we are really like on the inside. There's a popular idea, a popular idea, it's been around for years, that basically humans are inherently good, everybody's basically okay. Not only that, we're kidding ourselves into thinking we're getting better and better and better all the time. But so, some of us are humble enough to admit okay, we've got a few flaws. 
I'm not perfect. Come on, you know, you can't expect. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I've got some shortcomings, some weaknesses. We're just 15 degrees off course, and one of these days we'll get it right. Have you gotten it right yet? Over thousands and thousands of years, has mankind gotten it right? And we refuse to acknowledge the real problem, the great rebellion, the corrupting power of sin that touches all of us. And this is much worse than we think. And we're seeing the fruit of that in our world today. God is saying, if you don't want me in the picture, let's see what happens when you're God. Or when you follow other gods. I'm going to allow you to go ahead and make your own choices. I'm going to allow you to show your true nature. And we'll see what kind of fruit that leads to in the world and in your life. And the Bible teaches that one day you and I will give an account for the way we lived our lives. The whole world will be judged, and, 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 and fairness, listen to me, justice, will be satisfied. One day I'm going to stand before God. And gee, don't I like to question him, huh? You know, how, if I were you, how I'd run things? I don't like very much the way you're running things, God. But on that day, he's going to have some questions for me about those times that I knowingly chose wrong over right, about those times where I had knowingly unleashed just a little bit of hell in this world and upon other people in my life that, like the butterfly effect, ripples and ripples and ripples. I'm not particularly excited about how I would fare in God's courtroom if all the evidence was laid on the table, if justice was applied to me. But every single one of us will, take a st will stand before God one day, and God will say, let's take a good look at your life. And friend, you are not going to want justice then. You're going to want mercy. And we ought to be careful when we cry out to God about life being unfair. Are you sure you want it fair? What would be fair? The Bible says that all have sinned. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's fair. That's fair. I think you'll be a lot more interested in mercy. And thank God, okay, thank God, I'm not, the sermon isn't finished. He doesn't give us what we deserve. Because no one here would stand a chance of getting into heaven. Because none of us are perfect. Only Christ is perfect. We all have sinned, but Jesus, God says we need a Savior. And I will show mercy for those who ask for it through my Son. And this son is not some dragon who requires terrible, horrifying sacrifices. This son is the sacrifice. He is the power. It's not an elixir. It's not a dragon. It's not an incantation. It's not deep magic. It is the sacrifice that Jesus Christ paid for your sins and mine on the tree. There's a third reason why God allows unfairness. Number three, God will demonstrate his empowering grace. Small comfort when it's happening, but there's hardly anything else that can build our Christian character like adversity. There's almost nothing else that can like make us cry out to God in our need and desperation like our pain. And adversity has a way of knocking us to our knees and allowing God's grace, sufficient grace, to flow. We can sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound. We can sing wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin, but we really don't know what grace is until God's grace is the only thing we got left to turn to. Have you ever been that desperate? God's grace is the only thing in this world that you never know what it is until it's the only thing you have left. When your last friend has hung up the phone after the long conversation, when you've gone through that long letter, when you've talked to your pastor, you've had your church pray for you, and now you've got to go out in that wilderness all by yourself, and you're wondering what is going to sustain you. Will you stand or fall? How are you going to make it? What is going to support you? May I remind you that when it is all over, you have discovered, "'Twas grace that led me safe thus far. "'Tis grace will lead me home." through the circumstance. This is the grace of God. You don't know what it is, no matter how well you sing about it until it's all you've got left. 
if you've got one more card to play, one more trick up your sleeve, one more person to call, you don't know what grace is. The Bible says God's grace is sufficient. That suffering produces character as we wait on the Lord, our only hope. So will you allow God's grace to make you better in spite of your hurts? Because of the mysteries that you can't figure out? Will you let him make you better or will you become bitter and resentful and angry all the time? And I know that you didn't ask for the problem you've got. And you can say, Lord, why me? And that's a legitimate question. But does there not come a time when you need to choose to let God take you through the Gethsemane of today, the cross-bearing of today, so that you resurrect stronger and better? You say, why God? Why me? I didn't ask for my marriage to blow apart or my spouse to walk out on me. I didn't ask for this illness. I didn't ask for this business associate of mine to rob me blind. I didn't pour in, to intend to pour my life into my child only to see that child become so ungrateful and so rebellious. I didn't ask for my best friend to stab me in the back. I didn't ask to have parents who mistreated me or now ignore me. I didn't ask for that loved one to die when I needed them so much. The point is, everybody has their own story of unfairness. So the question is, what does God want us to do with this unfairness. Three things real quick. Number one, accept it gracefully. What's the alternative? You say, that sounds so lame. Tell me what's the alternative. What would the world have you do? Live in seething resentment and rage the rest of your life? Live as a poor excuse for a human being and excuse your unproductive, slothful sinfulness because you've been hurt? Accept it gracefully. 1 Peter 4, 12 says this. Don't be surprised at the terrible trouble that comes to test you. Don't think that something strange is happening to you, but be happy that you are sharing in Christ's suffering so that you'll be full of joy when Christ comes again in glory. What's he saying there? He's saying you cannot avoid all trouble in life. Don't be surprised when testing comes. Don't be surprised when people hurt and disappoint you. You are in this world, but you don't have to respond like this world because you have a hope that is out of this world. Accept it gracefully, realizing that it is producing character in you and the promise of joy. When we suffering, we are sharing in an experience that Jesus himself endured. When we accept it gracefully, we are responding like Jesus Christ responded. And when he comes, or when we go, either way, we will experience the fullness of that joy that only Christ knows. Accept it gracefully. I know it's not easy. It sounds like a simple answer, but it's what the Bible teaches us to do. Next week, we'll look at a few of the stickier problems. Number two, respond lovingly. When you're wounded and hurt, respond lovingly. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. A preacher friend of mine, he's now deceased. Uh, I loved him. Everybody loved him. His name is Wayne Smith. He says, God says it's wrong to hate a man. But if he ever changes his mind, I've got mine picked out. <laughs> right? So we respond lovingly when we use our hurts to help others who are hurting. That's a loving response. It's not a doormat, by the way. But we don't have enough time for that. Okay? Number three, trust God with the ultimate outcome. 1 Peter 2, 19. If you are suffering, oh, a person might have to suffer even when it is unfair. But if he thinks of God and stands to pain, God is pleased. 1 Peter 4, 19. If you are suffering according to God's will, keep on doing what is right and trust yourself to God who made you, for he will never fail you. Jesus never fails. Even at the end of the line. I mean, what are you going to do about the six-foot hole? It's waiting for you. Even at the end of the line, when there's nothing left but a yawning grave, Jesus never fails. Put everything on him, man. Put everything on him. Do you remember the story of Lazarus? Jesus came too late. 
They needed an answer. They needed intervention, and they needed it now, but Lazarus died. And even then, Jesus never failed. Folks, this ought to change our whole perspective. Have you ever wondered when Lazarus was raised from the dead after he was raised, what could you do to threaten him? What could you do to fill him with fear, to scare him? We get so fearful for our lives because our perspective is so limited. What would you do to frighten Lazarus after Christ has raised him from the dead? You're completely disarmed. Nothing's going to rattle this guy, right? G.K. Chesterton, great Catholic scholar, uh, talks about Lazarus and, and pictures Lazarus hobbling out of the grave with grave clothes around him and getting a new perspective on reality. So listen to the words that Chesterton puts in Lazarus's mouth. After one moment, when I bowed my head and the whole world turned over and came upright, I came out where the old road shone white. I walked a ways and heard what all men said. The sages have a hundred maps to give that trace their crawling cosmos like a tree. They rattle reason out through many a sieve that stores the sand and lets the gold go free. And all these things are less than dust to me because my name is Lazarus and I live. All that dust in Ecclesiastes, all that meaninglessness, the dust in the wind, all these things are less than dust to me because my name is Lazarus and I live and my name is Jim and I'm a Christian and I live the story of Lazarus after his resurrection before the emperor Caligula. And Lazarus, you know, he says to Lazarus, I'm going to kill you. And Lazarus just laughs. <laughs> you know what? What are you going to do? And, 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 and he says, enough of this. You don't, you don't seem to understand. I have the power to kill you. You'd be a dead man if I wanted you dead. And Lazarus at this point erupts in laughter. He can't stop. He just finds this hilarious, it's uncontrollable laughter, and he emerges, emerges for air, and he says, Caligula, haven't you heard? Death is dead. Death is dead. And friends, Jesus never fails. And you may be walking through the valley of the shadow of death this morning, but Jesus never fails. Look, here's the bottom line. You're never going to get, you're never going to get at least this side of eternity, you're never going to get a complete explanation I'm sorry for the unfair things that are happening to you. But here's the bottom line, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. These temporary troubles are winning for us a permanent, glorious, and solid reward for all eternity, all out of proportion to our pain. And whether you understand it or not, whether you ever get an explanation for it or not, God never loved you more than he does right now. Forget the dragon. We sing at Christmas, joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Nor more let sins and sorrows grow. Nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow. Far as the curse is found. Oh, what a wonderful the name of Jesus. Do you know him? Do you know him? Have you embraced him with your whole being or you're still chasing deliverance? You're still playing games that the corruption really isn't so corrupting and you'll figure out a way. There is a way. His name is Jesus. There is a person. His name is Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. We'll partake of the Lord's Supper together now. You may have already picked up... Uh, a kit, but on the tables on each side of the room is a little self-contained cup with a wafer of bread that represents the body of Christ and a cup of grape juice that represents his shed blood. We welcome everybody to participate in this. You don't have to belong to this church or a particular denomination. If you confess Jesus as Lord, this is for you. And let it be a healing moment for you. Let us remember that the flesh that we dwell in is, it's temporary. But God has prepared a lasting hope for those who call upon Jesus, who eat his flesh, drink his blood, and 
faith, put faith in him. Jesus broke the bread and blessed it, saying, take and eat. Jesus said, no more sacrifices, at least not the vain ones that don't get anywhere. Because this is my blood of the covenant, shed for you once for all time. Whenever you do this, do this in my name. Thank you, Lord for amazing grace. Thank you for making a way. May we run to you. May we run to you. Make us holy, Lord. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for hope. Thank you for heaven. Amen.
mountain you won't climb up coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me to me for loving us so much to send Jesus as our Savior. You're with us through everything, through the good, the bad. You never leave us. That's so amazing. You go with us today as we continue our day and as we head into another week. Challenge us and encourage us. Lift us up, God. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great Sunday.